Thank you, Kathy, for that fabulous introduction. Um, yes, welcome to Antarctic Adventures with Adopt a Float. Tonight, I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about my 46 day expedition to the Ross Sea of Antarctica. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the floats that I was working with, um, a little bit about our Adopt a Float program, and um, just share some personal stories Excuse about the expedition. See if, um, if you do you have any, if you do have any questions, feel free um, to put them in the chat and then Kathy and Yogi will be monitoring the chat uh, because I'm not very good at doing that while I'm doing the presentation. Um, and if I am fine either with interrupting for questions or saving them until the end, whatever Kathy and Yogi, you guys feel like works with the questions. Um, so this, uh, the, the things that led me onto this expedition um, were uh, floats, uh, biogeochemical floats. Um, we had floats from two different programs. The program that I work for um, as far as outreach is the GoBGC Array or the Global Ocean Biogeochemistry Array. And this is a global network of autonomous floats that have chemical and biological sensors that are used to monitor ocean health. Um, they travel to a depth of 2000 meters and take measurements that help monitor elemental cycles like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen in the ocean. The other float program um, that uh, kind of uh, meshes with that is SOCOM, the Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling. Um, and like GoBGC, this is a network of floats, but this one is different in that all the floats are in the Southern Ocean, um, monitoring carbon processes in the Southern Ocean. Um, both of these programs, um, in addition to the measurements the floats take, um, they're complemented by shipboard measurements during the float deployments. And that's where I come in because I was able to be on board this expedition to help with the shipboard measurements um, as well as the outreach with our adopt a float program, which is a program where um, educators in a variety of um, educational settings can adopt one of the floats. Uh, they can name it, they can um, inspire a design for it, and then they can follow it along on its journey as it drifts through the ocean. And so one of the things that I did on board was I, um, as I deployed the floats, I would write, um, I would write some blog posts to connect with the educators and to, to share the information with them. Um, I have this animation that shows um, a day or the life cycle of one of these biogeochemical floats. And so, um, it's just a short animation, so I'll play it so that you can understand kind of how the floats work and what they do in the ocean. So there we go. Um, so they pro provide year-round carbon cycle analysis. Um, they have an internal piston that inflates and deflates a bladder. The first uh, thing that happens is the float descends to 1,000 meters where it drifts around for 10 days. Um, once it activates again, it descends to a depth of 2,000 meters. Um, the bladder starts inflating, which starts floating the float to the surface. And then along the way, it takes all of these measures uh, through the water column as it moves through the water column to the surface. Um, so lots of different biogeochemical measurements. Once it gets to the surface, it transmits that data uh, via satellite. Um, and then once the transfer is complete, it continues this cycle, it goes back down to 1000 meters where it waits 10 more days until it activates again for the next part of the cycle. Um, so one of these floats costs the same, costs about the same as two days on a research ship, on an oceanographic research ship. But these floats can collect data for more than five years and they can collect data in all seasons and in all weather um, when, when ships can't can't operate during the winter and during the winter weather. Oh, there we go. Um, and so my ship, this is the icebreaking research vessel Araon. It is run by COPRI, which is the Korean Polar Research Institute. It's based in Incheon, Korea, and it is um, a polar vessel, which means that it spends the northern summer in the Arctic in the north, and then it pops in at Incheon, and then it spends the southern summer 
in Antarctica in the south and then it just kind of goes back and forth so it researches all year round in the poles between the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, it's 111 meters long. It can break through ice um, of one meter in depth at a speed of three knots. And the ship generally cruises around 12 knots, which is not very fast when you're trying to get a long distance. As I discovered, it takes quite a while to get uh, between places on the Ara'on. Um, it, ca it, can, it has the capability to cruise 17,000 nautical miles without reprovisioning. Um, so that ones around the world. This ship can go quite a long ways um, without resupplying. It holds up to 85 people, which is 25 crew members and up to 60 researchers. Um, we didn't have 60 researchers. One of our, um, one of the projects got canceled right before the expedition. And so some of the researchers uh, were not able to go on the expedition. So we had a couple empty bunks, which was lucky for me. Um, so where do we go? Uh, we went to Antarctica, and if you look at the map of Antarctica, it's often oriented like this. Um, we were here in the Ross Sea, um, which on this map is on the bottom, um, but on all of our shipboard maps, it was the other way around. And so I just kind of wanted to orient you to the map that we're going to look at. It has uh, the Ross Sea here, um, the Ross ice shelf is, we were right along the edge of that for the southernmost portion of our sampling. And um, the Jongbogo Research Station, the Korean Research Station in the Ross Sea is in Terranova Bay, which is uh, right along this edge of the peninsula here. <clears throat> so this was our shipboard computer system. Um, it was on the internet, so anyone could access it on board the ship at any time. And it provided a lot of information about where we were, um, what our sampling plan was, uh, which was basically to just go back and forth um, through the Ross Sea. Um, it showed information about the ship, what our heading was, what our speed was. Uh, you could get wind information. Um, and then depending on which sensors were active at the time, you could get a lot of other information about the local area of the ship. Um, including the outside temperature, which on this one you can see is about minus six, almost minus six degrees, uh, which was actually pretty cold. Most of our days were minus one to minus two degrees Celsius, which was not that much colder than it is uh, where my at my home in Victoria. Um, the wind was a lot, you know, heavier where we were, but it was not blisteringly cold as some people might think of Antarctica. Um, this is my first look at the ship when we just arrived in Littleton in New Zealand. This was, um, masks were required, but this was my first exciting view of the Ara'om before I was able to board. Once I got on board, I had to find my cabin um, and everything was written in Korean. So that was a little challenging, but I was able to do it. My cabin was on one deck, which is one deck above the main um, deck. And if you uh, see the little red arrow in the front, my cabin was all the way forward of the <clears throat> the residence area and right amidships. Um, and so it was a nice little cabin. It didn't have any windows or portholes, so I couldn't see outside. So it didn't matter that it was bright all day and all night because it was always dark in my cabin. Um, and then, so here's a picture. This is actually two pictures looking in different directions. Uh, I had it's a little bunk bed, but I didn't have a roommate, so I had the whole cabin to myself. So I generally slept there on that bottom bunk. It had a lovely little desk area, which is where I would uh, write all my blogs and edit my photos. Um, it had its own bathroom and shower, um, and so and personal survival gear in every cabin. So that was nice too. Um, so then getting underway, what needed to happen? So the first thing that has to happen, I had 10 floats on board um, and each float needed to be checked out, checked out by the UW engineers before it could be given the thumbs up to be deployed. So this is um, engineer Greg Brusso, who flew all the way down from the University of Washington just for the day to check out these floats. So that's a tough job that he has, a lot of travel involved. Um, and add to that the fact that we had to leave port two days earlier than scheduled. So his time that he had to check out all the floats was compressed so that he could get it done. Um, it turns out there was a fuel shortage in New Zealand. And so we actually had to, at the last minute, um, 
switch gears and figure out where we we're going to refuel this vessel. And so we had to go to Hobart, Australia from New Zealand. So Greg came down. Luckily, all 10 floats checked out and we got the go ahead that all of them were ready to be deployed. Um, so that was really exciting. Um, and then he flew off back home after that. So then we had, it was a four day journey to four or five day journey to Hobart. Not much to do. And so I got busy uh, drawing on the floats. So part of the adopt a float program, like I told you, is that the schools get to name the floats and then we try and put a fun design on them. Um, and so I I came prepared with all of my million Sharpies because who knows what kind of designs I was going to put on the floats. So this was my adopt a float toolkit, if you were, if you will, all the different Sharpies that I use to draw the designs. Um, and that's me. So the floats come in a shipping crate. And so I would just open the shipping crate and use that as my little tableau to be able to draw on the floats and put the designs on them as we were as we were transiting to Hobart. This is a sample of the different designs that I was able to draw on the floats. Um, and they came from a variety of places. Um, on the bottom left, you can see there's Angel Ice Cream Float. Uh, shout out to Katie Lotus, who is on the call today. Her students drew that design and then she sent it to me and I tried to faithfully reproduce it on a long yellow tube. So hopefully I got it right. Um, some um images i would just kind of like searched around for on the internet for inspiration um that is in fact ariana grande there on the bottom toward the right um one of the schools in hawaii named their float ariana grande and asked for an image of ariana grande on the float so that was that was the best i could do for that hopefully they enjoy that image uh the one right above that is qe which is uh, queen elizabeth um secondary which is right in Vancouver, or sorry, right in Surrey. So that's close to home. Um, and then the images on the far right um, are both stickers that the crew and scientists from Copri uh, gave to me to put on the floats. But unfortunately, because a sticker would alter the weight of the float and the friction as it goes through the water, we aren't allowed to put any stickers on the float that you know aren't already there. And so instead of sticking them on the float, I had to reproduce them with Sharpie on the float. So that was the best that I could do with those designs. But that was actually a really fun part of being on board with all the floats for the adopt a float program. Um, so this is us leaving Hobart after we refueled. We, we stopped at the fuel dock and it took us uh, about a day to refuel. It was quite a long process. And then this is us pulling out. That's the tugboat earning his money, pushing us away from the dock. Um, so then from Hobart, we did um, the transit down south. And our first stop was to be Jongbogo Station. So this, along the transit, uh, we were deploying five out of our 10 floats. Um, and so the float team, uh, the people from GoBGC and SOCOM, and the people on board, we all worked together to figure out where the best place to deploy these five floats were. And so we had some uh, points along the way that we were going to stop. Um, and so this is just a, a quick little video of deploying the first float. They are hand deployed, so there's no machinery involved in putting them over the side. Um, we attach a little uh, temporary rope to a retaining ring, and then the crew lowers the float into the water, and the rope, the line is released, and the float floats away. So this is just a little shot of these guys this was the first float that the korean crew had ever deployed and normally it takes about two people to deploy the float and these guys all really wanted to help so the, you can see in this video they're all just like trying to get in there like what do i need to do and they didn't want anything to happen to it so i just i love this little video So then once it goes overboard, uh, this is that little line that is uh, just looped through the retaining ring and one end is just tossed overboard and then the whole line is pulled in and the float is free to drift off um, for the next five to seven years. 
Um, the float is uh, activated by pressure. So once it goes into the water, that bladder does um, de uh, deflate the, the bladder, which makes the float descend to 1,000 meters. So it just bobs at the surface for a couple minutes until the sensor is activated, and then it will just disappear down through the, through the water column. Um, so one of the things uh, that I was there to do is also uh, to take some water samples. So the shipboard sampling that occurs at each station that we deploy the float, every time we put a float overboard, we want basically some ground truthing. We want physical water samples to say, this is what the water was like where we put the float. And then this is what the float told us the water was like, and you want those to match up. Um, and so we were only, due to some of the weather on the transit, we were only able to take water samples at six or seven of the float stations. But this was an example of what it would look like. So this um, display on the graph is a CTD, which is a conductivi conductivity temperature depth display, which gives some information about the temperature and salinity of the water column. Um, as the CTD goes down to 2000 meters, the, crew, the scientists would look at this display and then decide which water they actually physically wanted to capture in their bottles. Um, and once they decided that, they would send the computer signal down to the bottles and on the way up, each bottle would close at a discrete um, depth. And that way you'd capture water from that particular depth based on the information that they got from the graph. Well, down below the company with it now. Yeah. So, the, and this is them, um, this was our first CTD water sample of the whole expedition. So everyone was super excited to see it come back on board. In this room off to the right here, it actually opens up to the outside and that's where the CTD apparatus will come and sit once it's on board. So this is just the excitement of the science party as they're waiting for the CTD. Um, this is the CTD itself. This particular one has 24 bottles, those gray bottles are individual bottles that can collect water at a certain depth. And that is me um, pouring water out of, at each CTD that I was collecting water from, I was assigned two bottles, one at the surface and one at the chlorophyll maximum. And so that's me collecting the water from one of my assigned bottles. And then I would process the water and send the samples back to Scripps, which is uh, doing the processing for the, the chemistry and the in the water samples that I was taking. Um, after our transit, we continued further south um, toward Jongbogo. And this is my first experience with sea ice. And it was pretty exciting. Um, I had no idea what was going on. All of a sudden it just, the ship, things were banging into the ship and it was loud and crashy. And I was like, ding, I think that's sea ice. And so, I want to say this was like 11 o'clock at night and I ran outside and took my first pictures of sea ice. Um, and of course we went through much more after this, but it was, it was still pretty exciting to be there. I had never been in the Southern Ocean. And so to see all this ice and, and the ship just going right through it as if it was no problem. So it was pretty fun. Um, I do have a couple of videos of us going through the sea ice. And so this one is taken uh, from the stern of the ship. So looking forward along along the starboard side of the ship. And this one, as we drive, as we kind of go by, you can see some big chunks of sea ice and, and they've kind of like gone onto their side and you can see how thick some of that ice is as the ship uh, goes by through it. Um, so then our first stop along the way was Jongbogo Station, which is one of two Korean research stations on um, Antarctica. This one is in Terranova Bay, um, and it's uh, beautifully situated on this little peninsula. Um, right below the crest of that hill, you can see a tiny little black speck. That's the helicopter that I was going to get to ride to go for a tour of Jongbogo Station. Um, the next day. So we arrived and we started transporting. We were delivering fresh food to them. And then we had a couple of scientists who were going to get off um, and do their research at Jongbogo. And then the next day we were all going to get a tour before we left. But so 
Oh, so this um, here, uh, the ship didn't dock at Jong Bogo. If you can see above the red arrow, there's just a tiny little like wharf there and it's not big enough for this ship to dock. So it just holds its position using its thrusters right offshore. It doesn't anchor, it just kind of uses its engines to stay right where it is. Um, so to load and unload the ship, they actually use these two Zodiacs and a floating barge and they'll they'll move the barge over to the wharf with the Zodiacs and then they'll move it back. And so it's kind of a long process to load and unload stuff from the ship. Um, this is beautiful Zhang Bogo um, situated on the end of the peninsula there, uh, the day that we got there. And this is Zhang Bogo, the day that we were supposed to have our tour and the helicopter was grounded and no one could get ashore and our tour was canceled. Um, and that was a big disappointment. I did offer to ride in one of the Zodiacs while they were loading the barge, but for some reason they said no. So I was not able to go for a tour of Jong Bogo Station. But the next day was the most beautiful day that we had on the whole cruise. And so it was a bit of bad timing that just the weather worked out the way it did. Um, but you can see on the bow of the ship, we did get like almost a foot of snow that day. So it's understandable that the helicopter couldn't fly. Um, this was just another bay south of Jongbogo that we did some um, fish trap sampling in. And then we, um, from Jongbogo, then we went into the meat of the cruise, which was um, oceanographic sampling throughout the Ross Sea. And so basically just back and forth along that S uh, curved, like that, that um, sampling track. And every so often we would stop and depending on which researchers had chosen which stations, uh, we did a variety of things. So we did um, some plankton sampling using different size plankton nets. Uh, we used um, some uh, frame trawl nets to find things that were a little bit bigger, a little krill and little silverfish. Um, we did uh, some mud grabs, so into the some cores down into the bottom to grab some mud and do some sampling of that. Um, and then uh, CTD, so lots and lots of water sampling. So at almost every station we would stop and, and lower one of those CTDs and grab some water. Um, and so throughout all of this water sampling, I had five more floats to deploy. And these floats were a little bit different than the other ones in that their programming was for shallow water. Um, so instead of going all the way down to 2000 meters like an open water float would, these floats exist over the shelf and so it's it's not 2000 meters deep, it was about four to 800 meters deep. And so the floats would just go down near the bottom and then come back up. And so they had to be programmed a little different. So I had five more floats to deploy along this sampling track. Um, we did encounter some more sea ice. And since um, I always find it fascinating, I have another video for you. So that brown stuff is actually algae that lives under the ice. And as the ice gets broken and twisted, the algae kind of washes up onto the surface of the ice. Um, and so that's kind of surprising when you, you expect it's going to be blue and white and, and pristine and you see this brown water. That's the community that lives um, under the surface of the ice. This video was taken looking straight down um, off the, the side of the ship. So it's looking down at the sea ice as we're driving. Um, so then as we got to the southernmost turn of our sampling, we encountered the Ross Ice Shelf, which is a massive, massive ice shelf. Um, and it runs just as far as the eye can see. Um, and it's an amazing thing to look at and to be near. It's just these huge cliffs of ice that just go off in, in either direction as far as you can see. And so I took this little video to try and show what it looks like, but it just the sheer magnitude of it when, you, when you're there is just not something that I expected. And it's just, it's hard to convey. So here's my little video of the Ross A Shelf. So it just goes off, off into the distance. And the day that we were there, I don't know if you can tell in that the mist was coming off the top of the ice shelf. And it was just, it was a really beautiful day to be near it. 
And so that was the day we chose for our group picture. We thought it would be uh, a nice feature to have in our group photo. So this is the scientists that were on my expedition. Um, I'm sure that you can pick me out among the sea of red snowsuits. Um, I am wearing my blue Ambari jacket. Uh, this was one of our coldest days that we had on the cruise. It was probably minus 10 and we were all, you know, it was windy and, you know, we were all trying to just get the picture. You can see this one guy has this little piece of paper. It used to be a banner that they had printed out and like says Copri Solomon and had all this stuff on it but it ripped within 10 seconds of trying to be unfurled. And so this is us just trying to get the picture taken before we go back inside. Um, this, uh, the guy in the front with the shorts is Ki Hong and he was kind of our, my host liaison. I worked with him the most to try and make sure that the expedition, that we, what we needed from the expedition, what they could offer that that matched up. So Ki Hong was a very important person um, as far as my, work with this expedition. Um, so then, uh, like I say, we had five more floats to deploy uh, throughout this sampling. And so this is just a couple of different slides of us deploying the floats. Um, uh, this shows the little retaining line, the, the deployment line, I guess, that goes through the retaining ring there. Um, they had to be deployed in most weather conditions, this you can see the kind of the wave is a, a little high up. Um, you know, the, the boat would be rocking and rolling and we would still put the float in and off it goes. Um, this one, you can see the snow on the, the edge of the, on the gunnel of the ship there and the, the guys with their gloves on and everything. And we still had to deploy them even in the snow because they had to, they had to get out. That, that float is called my buddy Eric. Um, and this was a beautiful um, sunset-ish. When I was down there, the sun never set because we were too far south. We were below the Antarctic Circle. And so it was many, many days of sunlight. And so to see something that even resembled a sunset was kind of interesting and beautiful. And so this was one of our deployments. That's actually the QE Explorer um, that was deployed in this beautiful kind of like late evening sunlight. It was beautiful. And that is Ariana Grande again. That is the West Hawaii Explorations Academy float with the portrait of Ariana Grande on it. So um, adopt a float. So the, the GoBGC and SOCOM programs are infrastructure grants, which means that they have they get funding to build and, and operate these floats, but they don't get a lot of ship time. And so one of the reasons that I was able to go out on this ship um, as was part of the outreach program that we have called adopt a float and adopt a float is um, a program that's open to educators everywhere and it's free and educators are uh, able to adopt a float name it and then follow it along as it goes through the ocean. And on the um, go BGC website and the address is there on the bottom it's go bgc.org. Um, under outreach, we have lots of information on our adopt a float program. And for teachers who adopt a float or any prospective teachers who are interested in using float data, um, there's all these different ways to um, access the floats and where they are and what they're doing and look at the data. And so these are some of the things that you can do with the floats once you adopt it. So I'll go through each of these um, and with a little bit of information on each one. So we have these interactive float maps that you can use to find, uh, if you have the float number, you can find where your float is um, in, in the ocean. And there's a map for SOCOM and a map for GoBGC. And remember the difference is just that GoBGC floats are from the global program and SOCOM floats are from the Southern Ocean program. So this map you can see on the top left is the SOCOM map. And I wanted to show you this. This is the current, this um, light blue area is the current ice cover. And if you can see right here in the raw sea, there's these five floats. Those are the floats that we deployed. So they're all covered with ice right now. Um, and so they do actually have part of their programming that if they try and surface and there's something above them, they will actually go back down. So 
while this is covered with ice, these floats will continue their mission. They will continue their profiling. They'll continue, you know, waiting the 10 days, but they won't actually be able to transmit their data until the ice clears and they can actually make it to the surface again. So these floats have, you know, kind of gone under the ice for the winter. And then we hope to see them again next spring um, when we'll get some data back from them. Um, this is the second type of map. This is a 3D visualization map. It has far fewer floats on it, but uh, what you can look at with each float is interesting. You can actually um, click on it and find a track line of the float. So you could see where the float has drifted from when it was deployed. Um, you can get the details of the float. So the different, what program deployed it, when it was deployed, uh, stuff like that, whether it's active. Um, and then you can actually get a 3D visualization of the data. Um, so these are the, excuse me, the 3D maps that are on the adopt a float page. Ooh. Then um, we have the adopt a float tables. Um, every float that has been adopted is put into one of these tables. Again, there's a table for GoBGC and a table for SOCOM. So you would need to know which program your float is in before you can find it in a table. And these tables you could search um, by the school that adopted it. Um, you can search by the expedition that it was on. And there's lots of stuff linked for each float. Like there's pictures linked, um, there's details of the float, and there's, um, there's ways to get to the data from this table. So if you are a teacher who has adopted a float, this table is a great way to find information about your adopted float. Um, and then as far as using floats in the classroom, we have this adopt a float viz, which is a way to visualize data that has been kind of like streamlined for teacher and education use. Um, so all of our adopted floats are here in this list and you would just need to find one of the floats that you're interested in. And then over here you have X and Y variables. You can create your own graphs for each float. Um, you, I've chosen depth here. And then under the Y variables, I've just selected all of them or the, the ones that I wanted were nitrate, salinity, temperature, oxygen, chlorophyll, and pH. Um, you can select as many as you want to put on your, on your plot. Over here, you can choose to get the information in a plot or a text file, depending on what you want your students to do with it. Um, and you can pick different dates. And so I just chose basically coming up to this week. Um, and then once you choose all of that, you just click go and you get a plot back. And so this is the information that is easily accessible for each float um, online. And these plots can be used uh, you can have students do comparisons of different times of year with the same float. You could have them compare floats in two different parts of the ocean. Um, you can have them look at one particular thing like salinity and have them look at salinity in different parts of the ocean. And so just accessing the data in that adopt a float viz, there's lots of different things that you could do um, with your classes um, using the adopt a float data. We also have a sticker contest. Um, it closes May 1st. This uh, one on the left is the winner from 2022. The one on the right is the winner from 2021. Um, and so we do use a student design for the promotional stickers for the next year for Adopt a Float. Um, so if you have artistic students or you want to, you know, have a, a art lesson or a, an additional bonus thing for your class, have them submit a sticker for our adopt a float for 2023. Um, you can find information on the adopt a float website at go-bgc.org. Um, so now back to the cruise. Um, of course, I love sea ice. So this is just another view of sea ice. This one was always interesting to me because it's just like flat pancake ice as far as you can see. And so this one, it's not so thick. So as it goes by the ship, it's more of like a sliding ice and you can hear it just push by the edge of the ship. Um, and one of the things when you see ice like that, that is, it forms these big, like huge areas 
is you can see wildlife. So these are my wildlife slides. Um, I have to say the wildlife was a little few and far between, um, but this one here you can see in the foreground here is one of the little seals that I saw. Um, I think I saw three. So this was one of the little seals that I saw and they just kind of watch the ship as it goes by. Um, they're not very bothered by it. Um, this one, I don't know if you can see it right in the center. That is one of the four penguins that I saw um, and they were pretty cute. I did actually see one of them jump from the water onto the ice while we sailed by. So that was pretty fun. Um, this one was when we encountered some whales. So I'll just play this short video and you can see uh, the whales as they swam by the ship. Pretty cool. Um, lots and lots of birds. I'm not a birder. So I don't know exactly which kind of birds that we saw, but they were cool and they were pretty and they're really hard to photograph. So this is one of my good bird pictures to, to share with you. Actually, I also would. Um, and so uh, a lot of people have asked what the food was like. Um, it was very Korean, lots of rice, lots of kimchi. Um, but my favorite was every Saturday night we would have Korean barbecue um, and it is a very social and communal meal and everyone at the table gets together and everyone helps cook and everyone you know helps prep it and so it was neat to be a part of that every saturday night um and so this is the little table that i would sit at and this is our korean barbecue on one of the saturday nights we also celebrated a couple birthdays um and so this is one of our birthday celebrations um you can see we had this great uh, vanilla cake and it had little strawberries in it um, and I think we celebrated three or four birthdays and so that was always fun to have that celebration. Um, there was uh, twice a week we would have beer and soju which is the the alcohol that's popular Korean alcohol um, and it's you have it it's similar to sake and that you would have it in little glasses um, but this particular week this is Antarctic ice and so we had special soju with Antarctic ice and I don't know if you can see it but it does have little bubbles in it um, and so it was like effervescent almost it was pretty cool um one of the things that I thought would be interesting is I was since I was on board for 46 days um, I tried to take a selfie a day so that people could see like what the sea state was what the weather was like um kind of where I was and so this is my a window into a little bit of every day of my expedition. So I'll let you see, you know, how it goes through some different weathers, some sunny days, some gray days, uh, but it's a good look into the what the the environment was like. <laughs> that must be <laughs> Oh, that's good. And that's us coming back into Littleton at the end of the expedition. Um, and that was our port, our return port to Littleton. And so that's the auto own at dock in Littleton. Um, you can see there's a cruise ship behind it because the Littleton is also a cruise ship port. Um, after the first thing we did when we got off the ship was we took a little gondola all the way up to the top of one of the nearby mountains and so I got a great look back down into Littleton Harbor and you can see the arrow is pointing to the auto own, which is not quite as big as it looked next to the cruise ship when you were down there at the port. It looks a little bit smaller. Um, so that is the end of my cruise. And at this point, I would love to open it up to any questions that you guys have. Congratulations, first of all, it was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Did you encounter any heavy seas? Um, we, on the transit down was the heaviest seas. And I wanna say they were like four to five meters. 
So nothing that, you know, would make, like nothing that you've seen in some of the videos of really heavy seas, nothing crashing over the side, but there were a couple of days when we um, couldn't uh, do CTD casts because the seas were too heavy. And so all that we could do is slow down enough to like deploy our float and keep moving on. Um, so we did encounter some mildly heavy seas, but nothing, nothing really big. So when you retrieve the water out of the canisters, <laughs> okay, the salinity a few hundred meters below was quite different from the surface. Um, yeah, usually there's like a, a film of pressure water at the top, and then the salinity increases as you go deeper. Uh -huh. yeah. But I am not a marine chemist, so I am not, not really, uh, that is not my area of study. And so I would have to take a look at the graphs and make sure about that. So Jen, you mentioned that all these water samples went back to Washington to be analyzed? The, so the ones that I to took Scripps? on board went to Scripps. Right. Yeah. So, so um, how did they how did they prepare them for that journey or <laughs> what did they that is a great <laughs> that's a great question because I had to do it all. And since I'm not a marine chemist, that's something that I had to learn for this expedition. Um, so because the Koreans uh, were doing a lot of the sampling that the float program needed, the Koreans are going to share a bunch of their data. Uh, with the float scientists. And so that's like a collaboration. Um, the one thing that we needed to collect um, was a particular measurement, um, high performance liquid chromatography, which is a, a way of me measuring um, some of the color in the, the water. And so I would have to filter the water on board and then freeze it at minus 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and then at the end of the expedition, we had this little like Almost like a, almost like a growler, like a little cooler type thing that you put liquid nitrogen all around, and it it like, it makes it super super cold. And then I would put the little samples wrapped in tin foil in this little tiny little metal cooler, and then we'd ship that to San Diego for scripts. And so that was like the last thing that I had to do before I left the ship is make sure that my little cooler was uh, charged up with liquid nitrogen and make sure that the shipper, uh, the, the shipping agent had it and knew that it needed to get to San Diego. And so that was the last thing I had to do was make sure that these particular samples could get shipped in a timely manner to Scripps where then they continue the processing um, in their labs there. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that would be scary to wait until yeah. I actually got there. <laughs> Yeah, and especially when I, I like really didn't know what I was doing. And so I'm just like reading the directions on the on the sheet. And because of the language barrier, I couldn't really confirm with anyone on board that this is what we needed to do. And so it was a lot of just faith in that the directions were written out as they needed to be. And and it all turned out great. Scripps had, uh, has gotten back to me and said the samples came back and they were they were great and everything was fine. So whew, big load off. <laughs> How many scientists were on the vessel? There were about 38 scientists on the vessel. Um, when I got on board, there were 35 Koreans from Copri and other universities in Korea. There were two uh, Taiwanese scientists who got off at Jongbogo, and there was me. So that was the, the makeup of the science team. Oh, uh, we did pick up on the way back. We stopped at Jongbogo and picked up a few more scientists. And we actually picked up um, three scientists from the British Antarctic Survey. So at the end, the last like week of the cruise, there were actually three other people on board who spoke English, which was it made a big difference. <laughs> it must be challenging not to speak your language for several weeks. Because it was and it was. And so the challenging thing wasn't that they couldn't speak English because they all had some level of English. The challenging thing for me is that I didn't speak Korean. And so all the shipboard signs were in Korean. All of the announcements on board were in Korean. All of the dinner table conversation was in Korean. Um, and then, you know, when things needed to be communicated to me, we could like we could they could speak English enough, but it was definitely a, a like an effort to to make sure that I was, you know, that I got a message or something like that. And so it was definitely difficult being the only non-Korean speaking person on board. 
Yes. There's some questions from the chat. Okay. So Orly asks, great floats, who designed and built them? That is a great question. They are built at the University of Washington in the float lab there. Oh, um, really? yeah. And yeah, so, and I don't know if they are the ones who design them, but that is, they're the engineers who, um, we, we had a teacher workshop there last year and we were all able to take a tour of the float lab there at University of Washington. And uh, so we got to see like how they design and test them and stuff. Um, and so all of these floats, I believe at, were built in Washington. <clears throat> there's a, I forget his name, but there's an engineer there who is, was anyway, before he retired a name member. Fritz Starr. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, Fritz Starr. Yeah. That's oh, yeah, right. Fritz. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Small world. He, he, yeah. Fritz. Definitely. Fritz is up by you. He's in Victoria now. He moved to Victoria. Oh, oh right. is that right? I yeah, saw him on an airplane a couple of years ago. I remember. <laughs> he he works for O O R Ocean Observing. Something they make like they look like surfboards, that have all these different. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, things on them. Right, 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 right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I see you have a question. Would you be at all interested in organizing a trip for name members to uh, go to Antarctica and perhaps look on go on the land and look for fossils? There's a guy at, at, here in the University of Washington who goes there and collects fossils all the time. Maybe we could do something like that. Maybe we could. We'll we'll call that a pie in the sky dream. <laughs> There's a comment from Katie, a perfect representation of the ice cream float. She says she loves it. There's a little oh. heart there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katie. I did my best. Another question from Orly, what species were the whales? They were whalish species. There's an um, answer from George <laughs> Matsumoto. They looked like humpbacks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, I don't know that I, they they look to me more yeah. like they would be like a fin or a say. They look a little bit like a roar qual, but like I say, it was hard to see. That's all we got was that little little, little bit of them. But I would probably trust George. He knows. <laughs> George put in a um, a link as well for Fritz. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> and those are all the messages in the chat. And so so I any have a question. other, go Can, for it. Um, are there any spare floats, you know, like rejects or something that we could put in the gorge here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any rejects, no. And, and, and I don't know that they would do very well in the gorge, being a, that it's only a, you know, a little <laughs> few feet deep. Well, that's why I reject, you know. Maybe I'll go dumpster diving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So, Jen, I'm gathering you're going to present at NMEA on this because that would be awesome, as always, obviously. Uh, I actually am not because I'm going to be running around like a chicken with my head cut off at NMEA organizing all the sessions. So, you guys got a special presentation tonight uh, because I have no idea the next time that I will present this. But it was fun putting everything together and kind of like reviewing the crews and figuring out, like pulling out, you know, which pictures were the best. So it was, it was a fun uh, activity for me to put this together. So I would definitely uh, give this talk again if the need arise. Well, I think it would be great for the teachers, and especially since it could be something that would be national. That's why I thought it would be oh, yeah. interesting. For sure. Isn't this for been sure. recorded? Isn't this that... is being recorded and it will be available on our name website. So at the very least, we could have a thing where all the people get together and you show it on a big screen. Yep, for sure. So... And Margie, I saw you had your hand up. Did you have a question? I was just applauding you, my dear. Oh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> the little clapping <laughs> hands thing. Oh, okay, good. I've, I've got COVID, so I'm not going to show you guys my <laughs> lovely self Fair right enough. now. I think Gloria put her finger up. <laughs> okay, um, I I um, got into the presentation just a little bit late, so I didn't hear the beginning of it. Um, I was just kind of wondering, I, I'm not sure when this program started, but I was kind of wondering how, with the graphs that you showed and that the information that 
different schools are collecting over over time, I'm assuming. Are you able to give some uh, data in terms of how the chemistry of the ocean waters are changing? Absolutely. Um, I can't personally give that, but but this the data sets are available for researchers worldwide. All the data collected by the floats is available online uh, for anyone who is doing any research on uh, nutrient cycles, carbon cycles within the ocean. And so that's what the floats are for, is for this long-term study of ocean health. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities to, to see how the float data is being used uh, by researchers um, when they're doing this. I don't know if any teachers have done any long-term studies um, because I haven't been able to connect with a lot of the adopt -a float teachers. Um, George has actually put a link in the chat on some of the ways the data has been used. And so there's lots of opportunities for that. So if teachers haven't actually got a float in the water for their class, can they still access the data to use it as a teacher? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, okay. they would just have to go to the adopt -a float website on the go-bgc uh, dot org and all of those uh, data like the adopt a float viz that I showed where you can do make the plots up that's mm -hmm. open to the public oh, anyone okay. can access it yeah. nothing's behind a, a like a sign in or anything it's right. all available huh. mm -hmm. but are you able to give us some data tonight of, of changes over time or I am not because I haven't looked into that. Um, I don't know if that's one of the links that George put in the chat, but that is not something that I have uh, access to just off the top of my head. Uh, and Heather I think, has her hand. Yeah. Up. Heather. Yeah. Hey, Jen. Hey. That was just an excellent presentation, oh. by the way. Thank you Thank so much. You. And your blogs as well um, uh, were just so engaging and yeah, <laughs> a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Um, so my my question is, do you know if there's how much uptake there's been by teachers and classes like here on Vancouver Island with the Adopt a Float program? Not many. Um, I just scanned through the list the other day, and I don't know that there's been a lot of. Vancouver Island. I think we had one from the UBC Okanagan, and then my brother-in-law is a principal in Surrey. Um, but I don't think there's been a lot of people um, on Vancouver Island, and that's something that we could, you know, use name to promote um, and try and get uh, more teachers from Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. Where uh, have most of the uh, that can you uh, sort of, you know, summarize um, because it's an international Where program. But yeah, it's know, an international program. Most of them are from the US, like most of the adopt float teachers are from the US. And I think that's just because um, the five organizations that are running the float program um, are HUI, uh, Woods Hole, Ambari, the University of Washington, uh, Princeton, and Scripps. And so those are all US based organizations. So I think most of the teachers in the adopt float program have heard about it through um, their networks in the U.S. And so I think I, I think mostly it's pretty spread nationwide in the U.S. Um, and then I think we do have um, a couple of internationally adopted floats. And George could add more to that because he's kind of follows it more uh, closely than I do. Because mm -hmm. I can see, like, for example, like the Royal BC Museum, you know, mm -hmm. uh, adopted one and then having a display, like an ongoing display about it, you know, at the museum or, yep. Um, yep. I would think that Ocean Network Canada too would be all over it. Right. It's, you know, all about the monitoring. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and they've got a good network of teachers and stuff too that, uh, you yeah. know, emphasizing that sort of data intense, um, you know, kind of program. Right. For sure. And lots of yeah. opportunities for collaboration and, and getting them out there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I signed up, but I haven't got my float yet. Oh, you haven't been assigned a float? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and George it says looks that, like that George is, yeah, George is yeah. putting all kinds of um, <laughs> links and information onto the chat. Yep, and I will um, make sure that these links and stuff get um, up onto the name website along with the video from this chat so that any links that we have here are going to be available on our website. Great. Ooh. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have one in your backyard yet? Up in there, sitting there? Maybe a little <laughs> mock-up. I do not. Yep. 
No, we don't have one back here in the sandwich inlet. You could deploy it from your front porch. That's right. <laughs> Just toss it overboard. There must be some uh, collaboration with ocean networks. Is there? On... I mean, I most of the floats are so. elsewhere in the ocean, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations to you yeah. for taking the initiative to do this. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. And um, hi to all my family and friends. And and hope you guys learned a little bit about my expedition and about the Adopt-a-Float program um, and what teachers can do with the data in their classrooms.